1955, in March, my father uh, began the world's first successful series of open heart operations using a pump oxygenator. <clears throat> there were eight patients. All had been approved by the Board of Governors at the Mayo Clinic, and they were determined to do all eight, even if the first seven died. Out of that group, there were four survivors and four died. So that began the, the history of open heart surgery as we know it today. And those were all, of course, patients with congenital heart disease. So for a period of about nine months, incredibly enough, the only place in the world that you could have an open heart operation was in the state of Minnesota. So that was 1955. <clears throat> So things uh, really exploded after that, and there was really no acquired uh, operation for acquired heart disease uh, that we that normally predominate today. There was no valves available until the 1960s. Coronary artery bypass grafting wasn't available until about 1968. Uh, so in 1966, maybe a little before, they were recruiting for a uh, a surgeon replaced Champ Lyons here. <clears throat> My father came down as a consultant. Uh, <clears throat> it didn't take long before Joe Volker, who was then president of the university, uh, engaged in some in, in rather serious discussions. And I was a, I was a high school student in, uh, in uh, Rochester. And <clears throat> so just as I had gone off to college, these conversations began. And uh, so this all ended up in him making this unusual decision to come to Alabama uh, and um, set his roots here for the second half of his career. And, and that's the way it all began in 1966. They began operating in 19, late 1966, early 1967. So really overnight, UAB became one of the centerpieces uh, in the world for congenital heart operations. They were uh, having patients come from Germany, all over Europe, South America, and all over the United States. Uh, and as that program began to expand, many people didn't understand why you would want to come from a famous place like the Mayo Clinic to Alabama. And in fact, when, when I, I was a sophomore in college at Ohio State University when <clears throat> I knew he was having these conversations and he later would talk to me about it and um, he found it I guess a little amusing that <clears throat> that some of his colleagues at the Mayo Clinic were were quite disturbed about him coming to Alabama and and actually one of or more of them said John you know, we don't, I mean, it's, we're obviously going to miss you when, you when you go elsewhere, but we wouldn't mind it if you were going to Harvard or Hopkins. But Alabama, that sort of makes us look bad. So that was the, that was the, the backdrop of, of, of the decision-making process. And, uh, you know, I had many conversations over the years with my father about what motivated you to pick Alabama? It's interesting, he had been recruited when I was still in high school to go to Stanford <clears throat> and develop a Department of Cardiac Surgery there. He, he turned that down um, for a variety of reasons and Norman Shumway did take that job and ushered in the era of cardiac transplantation several years later. So it was all very, very, uh, um, serendipitous how things worked out. But I think he saw it in Alabama after he came down as a consultant that, that this was, a, this was a, a, a city and a hospital and a medical environment that, that one could mold into something that could be an imprint of yourself. And as, as successful as he was, that wasn't really possible at the Mayo Clinic. Everything was very set. Everything was, they were quite conservative. Um, uh, everything was, was full of, even in those days, regulations and approval. I mean, uh, they had to work very hard to uh, get approval to start the first series of open heart operations. 
So I think he was very enamored with the possibility of, of building something, uh, of, of literally creating something. And the people here were forward thinking. Uh, they were not at all in the, in the typical mold of, of the way the rest of the country viewed the South in, in the late 1960s. And um, so he, he saw it after all the pieces were explained to him and, and he got to know Joe Volker and other people here that uh, he saw this as a really unique opportunity to make something very unusual. And so he came. It came into full swing in 1967. <clears throat> he developed uh, uh, a, a very aggressive approach to residency training and education. Uh, <clears throat> the first series of uh, cardiovascular residents finished in the early 1970s and a very talented surgeon named Robert Karp stayed on and then after him another they trained Nick Kachuka stayed on and then another after that uh, Al Pacifico and those three surgeons combined with my father is really the four basic surgeons here for a decade. Another surgeon named George Horn was added who had tra trained elsewhere for adult cardiac surgery <clears throat> but then uh, during the entire decade of the 1970s, things were incredibly busy with he and Al Pacifico doing a large amount of congenital heart disease. Nick Kachuk is doing a moderate amount, but the three of them uh, really began to push forward and enhance the reputation of UAB. Now about the same time, <coughs> in the early 1970s, <coughs> there was a really a, a young genius named Gene Blackstone. And that name is very important because he was, he was really a, a mathematician, if you will. Um, he had taken an internship, but he really didn't want to practice medicine. He was at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> and so he came down looking for a way that he could make a difference in the application of statistics and outcomes research to medicine. He had considered cardiology very seriously. Uh, then he happened... Uh, the circumstances I'm not quite sure of. He happened to hear about Dr. Kirkland, so he came down here and interviewed. And uh, he agreed to, to take one year of an internship, or the equivalent of that, uh, just pro forma. And then he went full bore into, into research, and they developed really a 20-year a or more uh, bonded relationship in which they uh, we're at the epicenter of outcomes research in cardiac surgery in the world. And this was really fundamental in, in both promoting the, the good things that were happening at UAB and also pushing, field the field, pushing forward the field itself. With Lou Shepard, who, who is a bioengineer at UAB, and Lou Shepard was, was instrumental in working with Dr. Kirkland and, and all the surgical colleagues in developing the first computerized intensive care unit in the world. Uh, and they had computerized algorithms for administering blood, starting catecholamines. Uh, and this was uh, really a, a premonitory development to what is commonplace today in intensive care unit. So this was in the 1970s. And, then, and <clears throat> so by the, by the 1980s, they were really uh, at, at full bore and he was 1980, uh, he was in his 60s, and uh, and I came here in 1980 after finishing uh, a residency in a cardiothoracic uh, residency in Boston at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Children's Hospital. I had been here as a medical student and <clears throat> had learned about these these statistical techniques as well as the way of operating. Uh, in Alabama, and I can't deny that I, I, I was hesitant to just throw away those genetic threads and not actually uh, engage in the environment that had been so successful here rather than just hearing about it uh, or reading about it. And so I took an additional fellowship here um, <clears throat> in 1979 through 1981, um, and uh, became immersed in this environment and then stayed on the faculty after that.